You don't want to go to jail. Yeah, I know some of you have said to me, well, I wouldn't mind going to jail. It's uh, three meals a day, a roof over my head, all for free. But no, it's not. Nothing is free when you have no freedom. I've seen quite a few people in jail, and I've yet to meet anyone who is content, who is happy to go to jail. In fact, people will do anything to avoid jail. They will lie about their names, their identity. They will plead and argue and cry and yell and fight or fly on foot in their vehicles. They will run just to avoid jail. They will pay the sums of money that they can't afford to the bondsman or they beg and force their loved ones to do it. Nobody wants to go to jail. And when they end up being in jail, no one is ever happy, content to be there. They hate it, except for this one guy. When he was in jail, he didn't complain. One thing you get a lot in jail is you have a lot of free time. So he wrote this letter to his friends. And here's some of that letter. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Of course, you recognize the guy that wrote that letter who was, when he was in jail, was St. Paul. And he wrote this letter to the Philippians. And we heard that a part of that letter just a few minutes ago. Once again, he was in jail, but he was content as content as he was, he says, in any place or any circumstance. Because he says, I've learned the secret of how to be content, even in jail, a place that everyone else would do anything to avoid. Now, jail is not something, probably something that's uh, looming in your future that you would want to avoid at all costs. But there are places and situations, circumstances, and people that you probably would do anything in the world just to avoid, to escape. Loss of job and income. How about prolonged conflict with your child? Wouldn't you do anything in the world to escape that? You would do anything in the world to avoid chronic pain, terminal disease, cancer. Whatever it is that you would run away from and do anything in the world to run away from. If you were to find yourself in that situation, if you are in it right now, are you content? Would you be content? Well, let's be honest. Never mind those big events, those overwhelming circumstances. We lose contentment at the drop of a hat in a lot less devastating circumstances. Even tr trivial things can derail us. Does that happen to you? Maybe it even happened this morning. Maybe you were running late to church and the kids were hard to get out of the door. They can't get dressed, can't find their shoes. And what do you do? Hurry up. Let's go. Are you ready? Are you content? No. Maybe driving down the road, somebody does something or is not driving the same way that you do perfectly. What do you do? 
your discontent. We can go on and on with this list, but just watch throughout the day how many times you've la lost that sense of contentment over small things, and once again, never mind those big ones. So if we are losing our contentment in those not very significant things, certainly it's hard to not lose contentment when it's something major that is happening in your life. So as I survey my life, as I look at it, if I'm honest, I can say it's hard for me to be content. When I'm brought low, I get low. When I face some kind of a need or even hunger, it doesn't take too long before I start complaining and whining or even snapping at other people. Do you do that? Yeah, I'll end up feeling guilty and apologizing, but I know this is going to happen again at some point, no matter how hard I try to be content in whatever situation. It just does not pan out. My guess is I'm not alone in this tendency to be discontent. I'm pretty sure that you've been there too. And why do we do that? And more importantly, how can we find this type of contentment that Paul is talking about. What is this secret that he is mentioning in his text? So let's get back to Paul, who writes this letter once again in jail. I think one of the main things that you see people realize once they get to jail is that they realize that they're not in control. In fact, being in jail proves uh, a different point, quite the opposite. Somebody else is in control. Somebody else is telling you what you can do and what you cannot do. You have to live by somebody else's rules. Perhaps that's what caused or helped at least Paul appreciate this fact as well. He was in jail. So he was reminded of the fact that he's not in control. And he's reminding us of the same We'd like to think otherwise, but that simply is not true. We don't have the final say. Now, we can make plans all day long. We can uh, project things that th this is the way it's going to work out. But you and I know that's not the case. Ultimately, God is in control. James 4 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town, and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What about your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So all we can do is we make all those plans is come before God with our requests and let him do what is good for us. Confident in his good will for us, we can have the contentment and joy that Paul is speaking about. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and let him handle it for you. Another observation about contentment is that our sense of happiness is often based on the current situation. Whether it's being in jail or losing your job or facing financial difficulty or uh, going through a personal conflict with somebody in your life, or uh, experiencing a disease. We tend to focus on what is happening right now, on the immediate present. We concentrate on our current circumstances. We see this picture that is in front of us, and we don't see the big picture. Think about Peter when he walked on water. He saw Jesus walking on water, and then... He concentrated his mind on Jesus, and Jesus told him to get out and walk, and he walked, and then he lost that picture, and he started concentrating on the waves, and he said, uh-oh, and he started to drown. 
Do you think Paul is concentrating on being in jail while he's writing this letter? Do you think he's thinking to himself, oh, wow, I'm in jail. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I might even be executed, which was the case ultimately. But do you think he's thinking about that? No. He's thinking about something else. What is he thinking that he's helping him to be content? Well, he tells us, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. A key to feeling content is not to concentrate on what you see right now, right in front of you, on the immediate, present circumstances. Look beyond. Look at the promises of God who says he will sustain you and carry you through, ultimately, to the victory over all of this sin and death. Yet the key that unlocks the door to the contentment is this. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Generally speaking, when we find ourselves discontent, lacking contentment, it's because we have bought into this cultural narrative that tells us that we need to be comfortable at all times. But you know it's not like that in real life. Real life is messy. Most days we have to deal with real challenges in this life. And if we don't have this foundation, a resource for dealing with the challenges, then we feel discontent because we feel victimized by the circumstances. We feel disappointed and hurt by the people and their relationships with us. And so we feel overall discontent. And beyond that, we feel angry and bitter and sad and depressed. So what does St. Paul say? The secret to the happiness, to the contentment in the midst of being brought low? What's the key that unlocks the door to happiness even if he is locked up, not knowing what's going to happen next? He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this word of God has been used by so many people under so many different circumstances, and you probably have heard this verse used by everybody to talk about all manner of accomplishments. Look at me. I can do all kinds of things. But in this context, in its true meaning, it's really talking about Paul and his sense of contentment through challenges. So what's the key? The key is depending on Jesus. The key is recognizing that I am weak, you are weak. Within ourselves, we cannot find the strength to be content. But Jesus is more than strong enough. So next time, as you find yourself caught up in those feelings of discontentment, just take a moment or as many moments as you need to recall the wisdom of this one guy who's sitting in jail named Paul, who's content in all circumstances. Acknowledge the problem and the discontentment that you have and remind yourselves, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen.